All right, then let's move on to the, to the next speakers. Okay, the so in-house speakers. Okay, uh, Professor Ronald Ru from the Department of Mathematics. Okay, at CHK, he has received many awards, including the Morning Sci Mathematical Medal, also the Hong Kong Mathematical Society uh, Young Scholar Award. Okay, so Ronald, please. Okay, yeah, so uh, thanks for the uh, introduction and I would like to thank uh, the science faculty uh, for the kind invitations and give me this opportunity uh, to share about uh, my research work. Uh, so the topics that I'm going to address today is uh, computational uh, geometry uh, and medical image analysis. So uh, over the past few years, I've been uh, focusing on exploring uh, the applications of mathematics uh, to analyze uh, medical uh, images. So today, uh, I think, uh, uh, instead of uh, going too deep into the mathematical, uh, technical mathematical details. Uh, so I guess I I'm going to give an overview on how mathematics uh, can play a role uh, for this purpose. Yeah, so uh, I guess the motivation of my uh, research uh, is to explore, uh, is to develop some mathematical uh, models uh, to help doctor uh, to analyze uh, medical images. So as we all know, medical images are very uh, important information for medical doctors uh, to analyze, to diagnose uh, disease. Yeah, uh, but using human eyes to detect abnormalities in medical images is usually uh, very uh, challenging. And this is something usually happens, right? So this actually uh, motivates us to think about whether we can develop some mathematical uh, models uh, to accurately, effectively, and uh, quantitatively measure abnormalities uh, 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 in, in medical images. And this is actually uh, our motivations. Yeah, so more specifically, uh, uh, so in our research, we rely on a specific topics in mathematics called differential uh, geometry uh, to, uh, to, to, to develop some mathematical models to, uh, for medical uh, image analysis. So for medical imaging tests, uh, uh, usually comprises of three important components. Uh, the first one is uh, data processing uh, to pre-process the data such that the data is ready uh, to use right, for further analysis. So another important problem is the uh, registration problem. So basically is to find uh, meaningful one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, different uh, imaging data. So for example, if I want to compare my human face with your human face, right, then of course I need to find a meaningful one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So if I, if, I, if I map my left eye to your nose and your nose uh, to my mouth, right, then no matter what mathematic tool that you use, uh, the conclusion that you get is always uh, uh, unreliable. So finding meaningful one-to-one -one correspondence is very important for us to do systematic comparison between uh, data. And of course, lastly, uh, shape analysis is very important, right? So if you are given an anatomical structures, then you want to find out uh, how the anatomical structures deform, right? And then try to uh, compare between healthy and unhealthy subject. So uh, using human eyes to do shape analysis is challenging. So what we want to do is to develop some mathematical models, which allows us to accurately do uh, this shape analysis. So it turns out that all these three tasks are very related to uh, geometry. And this is the reason why we try to explore uh, the application of geometry to solve the medical uh, imaging problems. Oops. Yeah, so conventionally, uh, medical images are often uh, obtained uh, by uh, some well-known uh, uh, image acquisition technologies, uh, for example, the MRI or CT, computer uh, tomography. So basically you have uh, anatomical structures, 3D anatomical structures, you get slices uh, of 2D images, right, uh, capturing uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the anatomical structures. And medical doctors usually uh, analyze uh, the 2D uh, images uh, by uh, human eyes, right, and then try to detect abnormalities, which is uh, very challenging, right? So, so uh, yeah, so, but uh, one important observation is that uh, anatomical structures are three-dimensional shapes, right? So, so if we just analyze uh, the medical images by looking at slices of 2D images, then very often you may uh, uh, lose the, some of the important geometric information. So what we're trying to do is, uh, so in our research, what we're trying to do is that we try to use some mathematical image processing technique 
to accurately uh, do some kind of image segmentation extractions and also some kind of uh, pre-processing such that we can rebuild uh, the three dimensional 3D structures of the anatomical structure accurately uh, such that we can, instead of only analyzing the two dimensional images, we can actually look at the three dimensional structures and then we can calculate, for example, uh, some geometric quantity from differential geometry, for example, uh, curvatures, uh, uh, normal direction and so on, such that we can do some kind of uh, shape analysis uh, more mathematically and accurately. So I guess one of the key features of our research is that instead of analyzing uh, the two-dimensional uh, images uh, slices, we honestly study uh, the three-dimensional uh, structures of the surface, and then we can uh, use some ge geometric quantities uh, to do uh, more accurate analysis. So I guess this is one of the key features. Yeah, so using our geometric models, uh, 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 mathematical imaging models, we are able to accurately uh, we have, we're able to accurately uh, attract, rebuild uh, the three dimensional structure. For example, this is a human brain. And then you can see that the important features like the cell code, uh, dry ride, uh, 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 are, are very accurately uh, reconstructed. And we can also develop some mathematical models to deform uh, the, the brain to, uh, for example, the, uh, the unit sphere, such that we can do computations uh, on the human brain more effectively. So this is for computational purpose. So, but the key message here is that using the geometric models, uh, we are able to uh, accurately rebuild the three dimensional structures. Yeah, so once the three dimensional structures uh, is, uh, is uh, of the anatomical structure is, re is rebuilt. So another very important problem is to solve the registration problems. So as I mentioned, uh, the registration Yeah, yeah, so registration problem, yeah. So the goal is to find important one-to-one -one correspondence between different medical data. So this is very important, right? So once we have the one-to-one -one correspondence between different data, then we can do systematic uh, comparison. Also do some kind of statistical analysis, morphometry, or even processing. So whatever anatomical structures that you have, the data that you have, we've got a collection of data, then the next step is we need to find important uh, correspondence between uh, the anatomical structures. But you know, some of the anatomical structure is very uh, complicated. For example, this is the uh, vestibular system, which I'm going to talk about later. So finding one-to-one -one correspondence, meaningful one-to-one -one correspondence between these shapes is also very complicated. So the, so this, so this that involves a lot of mathematical uh, problems. So uh, that is the reason why our group are very interested in, uh, in, this, in this topic. So for example, uh, just take uh, human brain mapping as an example. So on the human brain, there are some important features, which is called so-called landmark. So medical doctor are uh, able to label those features landmark. So if you just use a random mapping uh, to uh, find the correspondence between them, then very often they can see that the important features landmark cannot match consistently to each other's, right? So, so you put it back to our human face example. It is like your eyes map to your nose and your nose map to my eyes. My mouth, right? So this is not uh, this is this is not a a a, a, a reliable uh, registration, a, a one to one correspondence between the two brains. So uh, so in order to solve this problem, so uh, we develop some mathematical models to uh, find uh, this registration map between uh, the human brain. So of course, right? So finding the registration map directly between the human brain is very complicated <laughs> because the brain is a, it has a very complicated geometry. So our strategy is to use some mathematical models to something called conformal parametrize, flatten the brain to some 2D domain. Okay, such the computation can be done on the 2D, right? And then the registration problem can be done right directly on the two-dimensional domain by solving a optimization problem. So this optimization problem aims to minimize some sort of regularization terms to minimize the geometric distortion and also the uh, landmark mismatching term, trying to match the uh, landmark features. And by minimizing uh, the energy functional, then we are able to find the mapping between the par parameter domains. And then uh, finding the composition mapping will basically uh, give you the uh, registration map between the two brain surfaces. So using our algorithms, uh, we are able to accurately uh, find out the shape-based landmark matching registrations uh, with multiple landmark between human brains. So here we have uh, two human brains, right? So initially you see that the landmark does not align with each other's, but after we compute the registration, then you can see the lemma align consistent with, uh, consistently with each other's. And then once we have this registration map, then we can do systematic comparisons. Yeah, so one of the application 
uh, is, for example, is to build uh, the average rate, right? So if you have a group of uh, a healthy or unhealthy group, so what we want to do is that we want to understand how the mean rate of the healthy and unhealthy group looks like, such that you can do some kind of statistical analysis, or you can also get a template shape for further analysis. So this is uh, just one of the applications for uh, the registration, yeah. So this is sort of like a pre-process before we can do any further analysis. Yeah, but after we have done these registrations, we find the one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, different imaging data. Of course, the most important things that we need to do is to do shape analysis, right? So the, 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 the purpose of shape analysis is to detect uh, shape abnormalities on organs. And it's very important for uh, diagnosing uh, diseases, right? For example, to detect a uh, brain tumor or for Alzheimer's disease, you want to understand the abnormal deformations on the hippocampal surface and so on. But this process is very, very difficult if you just try to use your human eyes, selected eyes to, to, to do it. So, okay, 10 minutes, okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so here is just challenge for you. So if, uh, you see this, uh, these are two brains of the same patient. Okay, uh, measure at different times. So can you tell any difference between the two brains? <laughs> yeah, no, right? So, okay, so yeah, but if you try to do the zoom in, okay, so this is the zoom in of this part, atomic to zero, and then uh, it is the zoom in of this part, the same part, right, after some time. And then I hope you can see this, this uh, some kind of dry right thickening occur, right, on the human brain. Right. So what I want to point out is if you just use human eyes to look at the uh, shape changes, it's very challenging. So what we want to do is to develop some mathematical models. So in order to do shape analysis, uh, one of the techniques, one of the strategy that we have used is to uh, uh, use something called Beltrami coefficients uh, in, uh, in the field of computational uh, uh, quasi-conformal uh, geometry. So basically, once you have the registration map between the two brains uh, or on the, uh, on the parameter domain, then you can actually calculate the Beltrami coefficient, which is just a quotient of par uh, partial derivative, which can be computed easily. And then you can measure, right? You can measure the local geometric distortion uh, of the two brain. So the Beltrami coefficient is, uh, is the quantity that measure local geometric distortions uh, very effectively. So for example, in our situation, then you can actually parameterize right, uh, the brain onto the 2D domain for easier visualizations. And then we calculate the Beltrami coefficient. And the color map here basically tells you the magnitude of the Beltrami coefficient. The white color means larger Beltrami coefficient. So you can see that, for example, this part corresponds to this part of the brain. So you can see that uh, which part, which regions right, of the human brain correspond to a larger geometric distortion. So then uh, using this mathematical quantity, we can uh, more accurately and effectively uh, to measure low, uh, geometric variation between uh, human brain. Yeah, so, so using this Beltrami coefficients, we can detect the degree of abnormal de uh, uh, changes of human brain, and it's very useful uh, for brain disease analysis. We actually apply uh, this Beltrami coefficients to uh, study uh, a disease called Williams syndrome disease uh, in collaboration uh, with um, uh, the uh, UCLA Medical School. Yo, another uh, application for the shape analysis uh, algorithm is to uh, uh, we, we apply to study the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is uh, subcortical structures in the human brain uh, controlling the long-term memory and spatial aggregations. So it turns out that this, uh, hippocamp uh, this hippocampus has an uh, important relationship to uh, Alzheimer's disease. So using the Beltrami coefficients and curvature, so we try to study uh, the longitudinal deformation patterns of the, uh, of the hippocampus. So basically what we does is, uh, what we did is, uh, uh, we measured the hippocampus surface at time equal to zero and measure it again after one year, right? And then we try to study the deformation patterns. Yeah, so, and then using the Beltrami coefficient and curvature information, we can effectively measure, okay? So the region, the local, the region where it has uh, geometric de uh, de uh, uh, deformations. So the, here the blue color means basically very small deformations and the red color means uh, very large deformations. So here, these two basically are the uh, hippocampus surface of two normal subjects. Then you can see that the deformation is very tiny compared with uh, Alzheimer's disease patients. Yeah, and then we can actually use this information to help doctor to understand the deformation patterns of the hippocampus surface uh, 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 and can compare the deformation pattern between uh, 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 normal subject and Alzheimer's disease patients. 
Yeah, so another uh, application of our geometric model is to analyze something called vestibular system. So uh, this project is in collaboration with uh, professors uh, Xilin and Jack Chen uh, in CHK Medical School. So the vestibular system is uh, uh, inner structures in the, uh, in, inside the ear. It's actually the first small structures inside the uh, 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 human ears. It contributes to a, a balance and our sense of spatial uh, orientations. Uh, it turns out that this uh, structures has uh, is very related to a disease called AIS, uh, adolescence idiopathic stroidosis. Yeah, and then uh, so so the medical school asks us to study this structure. They want to find out any any stru uh, structural difference between uh, normal and abnormal structures. So when they give me these uh, structures, uh, first of all, they don't give me these three dimensional structures, they just give me a two dimensional slices. And then we have to do some kind of image segmentation and then we construct uh, this 3D structure. It's not easy actually, because it's a, a genus free surface. Topologically, it's not easy, but yeah, we are able to reconstruct the three dimensional structures. But even after we have the three dimensional structures, it's very difficult for us to analyze it because the topology is difficult. So yeah, and then AIS is a spinal deformity affecting 4% school children worldwide. Uh, yeah, but what we're trying to do is that we try to develop some mathematical models to uh, study it. So it turns out that in defensive geometry, we have something called uh, universal covering space. So which allows us to cut the surface open, right? And then you can map it to something called universal covering space. And on the universal covering space, so we have some equation to map it to the universal covering space. And then on the universal covering space, we are able we are able to find out some important ge geodesic features like this A1, A2, B1, B2. And these are actually important geodesic features on the handle measuring the geometric the geometry of the structures. So now by analyzing these A1, A2, uh, uh, B, B1, B2 and so on, the ge geometric distance, we can develop some geometric models to uh, study the ge uh, geometric structures of the vestibular system. And we can do systematic comparisons uh, between the normal group and unhealthy group. And our finding is able to find out the shape difference in the lateral canal. Uh, this is actually the A1 and B1 canal between the normal group and uh, the unhealthy group suffering from AIS. And these two group, uh, these two, uh, in, uh, the shape difference in the lateral canals tends to be more statistical, statistically significant. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, and then using our algorithm to also try to uh, do something called uh, virtual coloscopy. So we know that uh, colon cancer is becoming more and more uh, 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 is uh, uh, common in, 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 in the world, actually. So, uh, so doing coloscopy is very important, but coloscopy is a very uncomfortable experience because you have to put, for example, a, a image capturing device into your bodies and so on. So what we're trying to do is that we want to develop something called virtual coloscopy using our geometric models. So the basic idea is that we uh, ask the patient to take CT scans, uh, just take a CT scan, and then we get slices of CT scans. And then we try to use accurate mathematical models to extract uh, the geometry of the, of the colon structures. And using our algorithm, we are able to, uh, you know, we construct the, the columns, uh, both the external structures and also the internal structures can be uh, captured. Uh, and then we can use mathematical model or shape analysis models to accurately detect, for example, the polyps, right? Instead of using the human eyes to look at the polyps. And using our, uh, the, the, the shape analysis models uh, based on Beltrami coefficient and curvatures, we are able to uh, uh, automatically, accurately uh, detect uh, uh, possible uh, polyps. So this actually helps a doctor to uh, use computer uh, to accurately detect uh, any abnormalities in your, in your columns. Yeah, so I have one more minute, maybe. Okay, so uh, lastly, uh, we also applied this uh, 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 on uh, blood vessel analysis. Yeah, so the ideas of, uh, for this project is that we want to evaluate the thickness variation of the plaque of patients uh, before and after treatment. Yeah, but then the blood vessel is also a very uh, complicated structure because geometry is difficult. So what we can do is that we want to uh, um, map, right, to the map the complicated uh, blood vessel to some phantom uh, uh, blood vessels, okay? And then using the registration technique, we can consistently uh, map the blood vessel, okay? And then we can actually uh, use uh, some geometric quantity to study the thickness variations of the plaque. And then it's helped doctor to visualize um, uh, uh, the, uh, the thickness of the plaque before and after uh, treatment, right? And then it's helped doctor to, to uh, understand uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the disease progress. 
Yeah, so here is an example. So the thickness difference uh, represented by color, the red color means the thickness becoming more and more uh, significant and can be computed on the phantom surface, right? And then the doctor can just look at the phantom surface and to study the disease, uh, the blood disease uh, progressions. Yeah, so I guess uh, in this talk, I just give, uh, I have just given a very brief overview on how mathematics, in particular differential geometry, can be a useful tool to study dramatic structures of three dimensional and the topical structures and to help out uh, geometric processing. And various medical, medical applications have been uh, presented. So I hope that uh, this talk will give you uh, uh, a feeling that mathematics is not just a whole bunch of abstract uh, <laughs> mathematical uh, equations, but it does has uh, a bit of uh, application, especially in uh, the medical imaging field. So with that, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Very interesting, Ronald. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I have, um, um, I think it's a clarification or curiosity more, uh, not really a question. It's, so assume in the brain tumor detection, in the initial state, there's a minor spot and there's not yet a trend mm -hmm. that form mm -hmm. that you can actually uh, through equation to analyze the trend just one minor spot. And then later when to develop more, it might be developing into an area that shows to deform the shape. Mm -hmm. So what is it that, that could allow you to do the early detections or analyzing the signals for the early detections? Is that possible? Yeah, this is exactly what we're trying to develop. Yeah, so I'm actually working with uh, uh, a company in the uh, in the science center. So uh -huh. it's a it's a it's a it's a company uh, trying to analyze the brain actually. So one of the software that they try to develop is exactly what uh, uh, you are suggesting. Uh, but of course, the difficulty is uh, you know the MRI data usually is not yeah, that yeah. clean. So you have to do a lot of image processing, p processing. If you want to detect the very small tumors. So even the very advanced imaging technology nowadays is still uh, sometimes may not be able to 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 capture it very accurately. Yeah. So I guess this is actually a very important ongoing uh, research that we are we are, yeah, we are yeah. exploring. Typically, yeah. they do thousands of images. Right, right. And trying to do the analysis is actually a humongous task. Yeah. And then later they say things appear normal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, this is excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Where do you obtain the data for analysis? Uh, yeah, good question. So <laughs> I've been collaborating with, uh, uh, you know, I, I graduated from uh, UCLA, so I still have some collaboration with the UCLA Medical School. And I, uh, so, the, so you know the question, right? So you can see the question. Yeah, so the question is how did you, how did we obtain the data for analysis? And any specific requirement for uh, the quality of the image data? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I said I've been collaborating with the UCLA Medical School because I did my PhD there, and I also collaborating with the Harvard Medical School because I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I did my postdoc there, and now I'm, I'm at UCHK, so I have a chance to meet uh, to meet with different medical doctors from the Prince of Wales Hospital, and they provide data. Yeah, so, and this is how I get the data. Yeah, but of course the difficulty is uh, the privacy issue is always uh, the problems. Yeah, so uh, I'm actually looking forward to collaborate with uh, mainland China and also we get much more uh, data. For example, nowadays people talk about deep learning, right? Artificial intelligence. But if you do not have a huge amount of data, so deep learning is, is, is just, a, it's just a joke, right? So we need a lot of data. Yeah, and then as for the specific requirement for the quality of image data, um, I would just say uh, first standard MRI data that we obtain and then we can do some image processing. So that will be our task, right? To 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 p process p process uh, the data. We we wouldn't require uh, those providing us data to give us very high quality uh, data because they have they, they don't have a method to 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 improve it as well, right? So this is our task, right? As a as a mathematician, right? So develop some mathematical models. So I would say any data from the MR MRI machine, so we welcome. So whatever data you can give us, then we, we like it. Yeah. So because data is very important for us. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, hello, Professor. Thank you so much for the exciting talk. So um, I, I'd like to ask two questions. So uh, I'm a, actually an, an undergraduate engineering student, so I'm curious about how uh, mathematical techniques compare to maybe less um, deterministic um, deep learning techniques, um, especially those which are se semi or unsupervised, which do not, or, or maybe zero shot techniques, which do not really require so, so much data or, or maybe fine grained labels. Um, yeah, so that's the first question. And secondly, I'd like to ask about, so I, I've, I've talked with a structural biologist friend who told me about some of the problems with like um, deep learning segmentation techniques. So um, it would some, so she was doing a 3D segmentation using a 2D method. So it's uh, on a CC scan, uh, so it's slice by slice. So she was telling me that like it, it would often output some results which are biologically impossible, such as branching at some very weird angles or like, 3D disconnections and yeah, I'm wondering, do similar problems occur in mathematical problems as well? Thank you. Yeah, so for the first questions, uh, uh, at this stage, I don't quite trust deep learning that much <laughs> for medical imaging uh, because as I mentioned, uh, we don't have that much data. Yeah, so usually in, if you look at uh, all the deep learning uh, paper in uh, medical imaging field, so they always have to do something called data augmentation. So that means based on very few data, they try to guess, right? Try to, try to deform the data, try to guess the data and then do a lot of data augmentations. But then this kind of uh, tech lead, I, I would say is very uh, artificial. So, so that's one. And secondly, uh, if you just use uh, you know, deep neural network to blindly train your network. I would say you, you don't understand what is going on in between, right? So you, you, you build an architecture and then you fit in a lot of data and then you get the result, right? You don't know anything, right? So I guess uh, a more uh, uh, reasonable things to do is uh, maybe we should combine uh, deep neural network, right? To combine data information and mathematical models, right? And for example, in the architecture of the deep neural network, you try to incorporate some mathematical models such that you understand what is going on, right? And then you can improve, and then you understand whether your analysis makes sense. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's what I think for uh, your first question about deep learning. Uh, uh, and then the second question is, uh, how to do this kind of 3D reconstruction uh, for, uh, you know, some, if, if there are some kind of branching and this kind of, it's always very difficult problems, right? So actually, if you think about uh, the vestibular system reconstructions, so in reality, after we do, after we have done the image segmentation, it's a, it has a lot of top, topological artifacts. And this is actually what you, what you said, branching and this kind of uh, uh, topological artifact. So we have to develop some mathematical models to handle this kind of situation. So for, for even for the vestibular system, it took us, it took us some, some time to develop the mathematical models. So yeah, for more sophisticated and topical structures, I believe uh, is, uh, is also a ch challenging uh, research topics, but, but still I think it's a good research direction. Yeah. Min Jung, thank you. The primary coefficient only make use of first derivative. Was second derivative more uh, useful? Yeah. So we have a recent work to combine uh, uh, the first derivative and, and 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 second derivative information. Yeah. So uh, well, if you just want to study the local geometric distortions uh, under the deformations, uh, so I would say uh, the Beltrami coefficient gives you a very good uh, 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 measurements. Yeah, but sometimes uh, second derivative also gives you some, some kind of uh, 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 good information. But of course, right? So if you want to make use of second order derivative, you also have some kind of requirement on your data, whether your data is moved, right? Whether your deformation is moved, right? So if your data is not moved, then you, you can't even compute the second derivatives, right? So, so that's, uh, that's the, we always have to balance uh, between. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you again, Ronald, for an excellent talk. Okay, let's move on to the next speaker. Okay, the next, next talk will be given by Professor Xia Jiang from the Department of Chemistry. Actually, he's one of the several people, few people in the Department of Chemistry working on biology, okay? So without further delay, please join me to welcome Professor Xia Jiang. Um, Ding Son and the Wen uh, and everyone uh, and all the colleagues. Uh, today is my great pleasure to share uh, some uh, recent work done in my lab, and uh, the title I call it is synthetic biology, uh, synthetic organelles. 
I'm going to show you how we can use these concepts to bring to bridge chemical biology in different areas and how we can apply it to, to the real world. We have learned about organelles through the talks given by Professor uh, uh, Shekman. And we know that a cell contains small structures, they are called organelles. And I quote this sentence as, as I think this is a, a wonderful definition of what organelle is, at least to my knowledge. An organelle is a nanoscopic cellular structure within a cell that performs a specific function that is embedded within the cytoplasma of eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. So to me, these keywords tells me organelles are subcellular structures and they are structurally independent and functionally independent. All right, so in the, these days, uh, we have heard about stories of synthesizing life. Okay, all right, synthesizing life is so difficult. I mean, synthesizing of cells is so difficult, let alone synthesizing a life. So look at the complexity of, of, of a cell. So in our lab, we ask ourselves, what about synthesizing an organelle? Okay, can we synthesize an organelle, a subcellular structure that, has, that are structurally and functionally independent? So I'm gonna show you two stories that we synthesize in organelles. Like one is we use the synthetic organelles for biosynthesis. The other, we use synthetic organelles for regenerative medicine, okay? So if we have a chance of open up a cell, for example, a prokaryotic cell, E. coli here, if we get a nanometer eye, a nanometer resolution eye, we will see the cell is full of uh, protein complexes. As we have labeled, there are transport protein complexes. There are citric acid cycle complexes, as you can see here. There are ribosome, there are RNA polymerases, so on and so forth. There are many, these subcellular structures, they are the complexes of uh, enzymes. Okay, they are altogether called the metabolomes. Multi-enzyme complexes, they're called the metabolomes. Okay, the question is how we can mimic them. So as chemists who are uh, really uh, uh, interested in creating these kind of structures, we started from uh, interactions. Okay, a peptide peptide interaction uh, that we can just simply assemble two enzymes together. Okay, put a long story short, you can, we can control the stoichiometry of these assembly. See here, we can have a four to two stoichiometry, four to eight, stoichiometry four to four, 16 stoichiometry of these multi-enzyme complexes. So we can put them together through a, okay, through a protein-protein interaction. Using uh, TEM, we can see these different assembled the structures have different uh, uh, shapes. On the uh, cryogenic EM, we can see, okay, we can really fit the model into these structures. These are all done outside of cell. That's what we, uh, what we eventually want to achieve as synthetic organelles because we really want it to, uh, to occur inside a cell. So what are the particular problem we want to target? So this is the problem we, we want to solve. We want to regulate metabolic flux by forming these complexes. So there's a particular problem, okay, I'm going to show you here. So in the cell, we use a bacteria cell, E. coli, for example, we can use it to produce these valuable products called the beta carotene. Carotene is what we got from carrots. Okay, we can produce it using E. coli. And the other thing is called astaxanthin. It's another carotene derivative. Astaxanthin is the strongest antioxidant in the world, strongest. So it can be used for antioxidant is a, is a lot of applications. But when we put all these enzymes inside of E. coli, we have a, one problem here. Okay, so after the E. coli grew up to this density, E. coli start to die. And you cannot reach a high production yield of these products, these chemicals. The reason is, one of the reason is during this, it has two parts, okay? Two sets of enzymes are doing this. One set of enzyme produce these intermediates called IMPP and DMPP. And then yet the other enzyme, CRTE, will combine them together. So that's the rate limiting step. So actually what's happening is when you force the E. coli to produce a lot of these products, 
these IPP and D DMPP are toxic to the cells. So cells cannot tolerate them. All right, so the simple solution that we have is, why don't we assemble these two enzymes, IDI and CRT together? All right, that's a little bit challenging because IDI is a, it's inside a cytosol, CRT is a membrane. But I cut the long story short, we assemble them together, we show evidence, and the result is impressive. We drastically increase the yield by tenfold. Though that's in the large fermenter. Now you can produce the, uh, by this single genetic modification, we can increase the yield of this estazancin or lycopene products by 10, 20 folds. Okay, that's gonna cut a cost. That's one example. The second example, we look at, look at the upstream. So that one, we only assemble two enzymes together. How, we, how about we assembling more enzymes? So in this example, we assemble three enzymes in the mevalonic pathway. Again, a lot of enzymes, but the, there are three enzymes that are rate limiting. So we assemble, assemble them together. I'm, not, I'm skipping the details, but I clearly see these kind of nanostructures are assembled inside a cell. Okay, so we can analyze these structures. They look like organelles to me. Okay, so for the first time, we can assemble these organelle-like structure inside the E. coli cells. Also, we use virus-like particles to assemble enzymes. Okay, I'll quickly go through it. It really can turn on the production of this molecule. This is called amorphodiene. It's a precursor of uh, 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 the anti-malaria drug, okay, amorphodiene. Now, they don't look like organelles, for example, to the well standard, because it's, it's, it's protein just assemblies, right? So we are now working on fascicles, okay? So this is a, one type of call, fascicles called a caviola, initiated by a protein called a caviola, one that's small protein. So what we did is uh, we assembled this kind of structure inside the E. coli, and, we, and then we appended enzymes on the, on the uh, outside of this enzyme, uh, of this structure. Now we can clearly see these uh, vesicular structures, membrane, co uh, membrane surrounded vesicular structures are constructed inside the E. coli cells. And through this multi-enzyme complexation uh, process, we drastically increase, again, the production yield of, of morphine, lycopene, uh, 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 and uh, uh, the, the other products, we can achieve that. So that's in the area of metabolic engineering and then synthetic biology. You know, we, can, we can construct organelles that are normally do not exist in product, prokaryotic cells and they can give functions. And then we can even purify these complexes and they are functional outside of cells. As I said, an organelle has to be functionally and structurally independent regardless of the cellular environment. So we can purify them they're not only inside, you know, functional inside a cell. When we purify them out of cell cell, they're still functional. That kind of fit into my definition of organelle. So that's the first story. Next story, we also use another type of organelles and we engineer them for regenerative diseases. These um, organelles are called exos exosomes. Exosomes are small vesicles that are secreted by cells. So that's a, that they are actually a mediator that cells use to communicate between cells. So for example, if I wanna communicate with Professor Song and I wanna keep distance, so I'm going to write something on here and I throw it to you and you catch it, you uh, open up the, you know, the note, you see what I wrote on it. So that's actually what exons done, ex exons done. They are doing cell cell communication in a remote way, okay? So their cells don't touch each other, but they can release out these small vesicles. They carry information and they can do communication. So uh, I'm not going into a lot of details into the exome research, but it's a very, very hot area actually. So you can imagine that cancer cells will secrete exons that carry the information of cancer. Okay, bacteria infected or virus infected cells will secrete exons that carry information of the virus and of carrying information of the bacteria. Actually, there's a recent research showing that exons can be used as vaccine to vaccinate a human body because it really carries the antigen and the information of the pathogen, right? 
So what we do here, uh, we use the exomes using the capability of exom going out of cells. Not only, you know, I need to secrete it out and other cells need to receive it, right? So I, we can use exom, we can engineer it so that exom can carry the information, drugs we want into the recipient cells. So we did the one, okay, so the one experiment we did was uh, we use human uh, umbilical cord mesochemical stem cells. Stem, exomes from stem cells, we want to treat autism. Okay, we want to treat a difficult to treat disease like autism. So uh, Professor uh, Rennie Shakespeare talked about Parkinson's disease. These are very, very difficult to treat. Nowadays, people are turning to stem cells. But how about injecting stem cells in your vein? How much cells can reach your brain? That's the matter is very, very, very small. But for hopeless people, they would do it. People in the United States, they are relying on the stem cell treatment for autism children, because there's really no other treatment at all, right? So we thought, could we use exomes from stem cells? They're much safer than stem cells themselves, and then we can deliver them into the brain. So what we did is we purified the mesochemical stem cell exomes from human uh, umbilical cord uh, uh, mesochemical stem cells, and we give them to the mouse through the nose. That's very important. If we give them to the tail vein, you can see here, most of exomes will end up in the liver. But if we give them through the mouth, through the nose, sorry, we drip, drip them in, into the nose, they will end up in the brain, as you can see here. Okay, we also analyzed that. So next we established an animal experiment, the mice, okay, before the mice were born, they received a chemical called a VPA. This chemical will cause uh, autism-like behavior in the mouse offspring. So the, you know, the mouse children will have this autism-like behavior. And then we then treat the mouse offspring using exon. So these are the uh, evidence that we show as improvement. I'm walking you through one by one. The first experiment is uh, uh, called a self-grooming and a rearing. So a mouse will, will do self-grooming, but an autism mouse will spend a lot of time doing uh, self-grooming because they are antisocial. So you can see the autism mouse spend a lot of time doing this, but when we treat them with the exomes, the time they spend, you know, are much less. The other one is rearing. Mouse are anxiety. If they have autism, they will spend a lot of time standing up and look around. So, but the, you know, I can see, so the, uh, the VPA autism mouse untreated, they're very nervous. But they, if they are treated with exome, the time they spend on, you know, on rearing is significantly reduced. Next experiment is social interaction. It's a very interesting one. If we put a mouse in a three chamber uh, 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 environment, on the left side, there's a, there's a novel object, a toy uh, that a mouse never seen before. On the other side is a, a stranger mouse, a mouse the mouse never seen before. For the normal mouse, you guess well, the mouse will spend more time you know, interacting with the mouse as a stranger to, her, to him or her. Okay, but for autism mouse, they will spend more time with the toy because they don't want to uh, have a social interaction with the stranger mouse. So after, again, after the treatment, the mouse become normal. They'll be liking the other mouse more, okay? So another experiment, okay, we do the follow-up experiment. Now these two mice know each other, right? So. We put this mouse that is already known by this acquainted mouse to the other, to the left-hand side. We put another stranger mouse on the right-hand side. Again, for artistic mouse, they will spend more time with the one he knows. But for normal mouse, they are more curious. curious. They'll spend more time with the stranger mouse, right? Again, we give them the exome, the artistic mouse, you know, start to get interested in stranger mouse more than the acquainted mouse. Okay, the last thing is the anxiety. If you put the mouse in the, in the open field, the mouse will tend to stay in the, on the side because they, uh, anxi uh, they have anxiety. They have spent less time in the center. 
that's a signal of autism. So exome treatment, the mouse will be more brave than was standing in the center, things like that. So all these behavior, behavior experiments showed us that giving mouse uh, mesochemo stem cell exomes through the nose is useful. Not only we treat uh, autism, we can use exome, we can engineer them to treat difficult to treat degenerative disease. For example, osteoarthritis, cartilage repair is difficult because there's no brain, oh, sorry, no blood vessels, there's no uh, liquid going through our cartilage. So how do we treat that? Eventually, if you have bad cartilage, eventually you have to go through uh, some surgery to replace it. But can we do other things? So we here we use the exomes as uh, drug delivery ve uh, vehicles. We engineered the surface of exomes, so the exome will go into a type of cell called chondrocytes. There are chondrocytes in, the, uh, in our joint, and they are the source that we can uh, do the regeneration. So again, cut the long story short, we can engineer it, we can um, put them into the joint of the mouse. They actually really go into really deep of the cartilage. We know cartilage is a very dense structure. It's very difficult to, to, to let the drugs go through it. But exomes, magically, they can find their way, eventually reach the deep layer of the cartilage and then meet chondrocyte. We actually did a very small molecule drug, <clears throat> mRNA drug, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system into chondrocytes, which really can do the fixing work. So uh, again, I'm speaking, uh, skipping a lot of details here, but trust me, the mouse are fixed. So to summarize, uh, we have shown uh, during recent years that organelle-like substructures, subcellular structures can be synthesized inside the cells. And synthetic organelles are structurally <clears throat> and functionally independent units of life. They're not another type of nanoparticles to me. There are different kinds of life deriving molecules, the, the structures. And a synthetic organelles or repurposed organelles can be used for biosynthesis of our medicine. What, what are we looking for? The outlook is one, how we can use a synthetic organelle to help us better understand the life. Second, how we can use them for a better life. And of course we welcome collaboration and only through extensive collaborations, we could jointly solve big problems. So lastly, uh, <clears throat> thank my students. And these are our honorary students, honorary uh, lab members. They have graduated, graduated in, uh, uh, from the lab and uh, we are still collaboration. And the funding supports, and there are two companies that are, uh, give us a lot of support and I'm, uh, I'm the chief, uh, chief scientist uh, in these two companies. And we are thinking about, we're just uh, uh, starting the third company. Also, I'm serving the role of chief scientist uh, in this company. And uh, all the funding agents um, and the support from Japan Chemistry made this possible. Thank you so much for your attention. All right. Thank you again, Sajan, for a very nice talk. I think we opened the floor for questions. Talk. I, 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 was, I have uh, several questions. The first one is uh, the, your first part of the talk. So you, I was kind of lost. So you introduced some uh, uh, component into the E. coli uh, to have some kind of uh, assembly which can produce some chemicals. So how did you do that? How did you introduce uh, the component into the cells? Uh, enzymes. For example, to synthesize a lycopene, you need a 10 plus an <coughs> enzyme, about 15 enzymes. You put them into the E. coli. E. coli will become a cell factory and then start to produce the products that you want. So you mean you assemble the protein complex in vitro, then you introduce the protein complex inside of the cells. Well, that's actually done differently. So we do uh, assemble protein outside of cell, but for the in 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 intracellular work, we put the genes of these enzymes inside a cell. Ah, so we the, put the genes so the cell will produce the enzyme in situ, then the enzyme will do its work. Okay, so different components you can 
self assemble inside the cells. Yes. Okay. The question, spontaneous. The, yeah. The sec the sec question is about the the exosome. Uh, yeah. So, so what is so how long can the exosome stay in the in the brain? Well, that's okay. a very good question. <clears throat> uh, so, so we we have uh, done a very preliminary experiment. Uh, we haven't done that uh, in the brain uh, for a long time yet. We have done that in the joint, in the joint. Our exome normally we believe will, will, will hang around for some time, but eventually, because this is exogenous, right? It's from outside. Eventually they will be taken out by the body and then degraded. So we are still figuring out the kinetics, how long uh, it takes for them to be cleaned up. And eventually where do these exomes do? But uh, trust me, they are much safer than cells, yeah, right? If you put a cells in the brain, I, God knows what's going to happen, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another question is that is this exosome uh, MNC specific? So if we give like fibroblast derived exosome to the mice, can they do they have the same their effect? We choose MSC exome for the reason because mesochemal stem cells are known to be regenerative, right? Uh, uh, they are known to uh, people actually use uh, mesochemal stem cells to treat autism, right? So here we just make a one step forward. Uh, instead of using cells, we can use exomes, right? So that's a natural, logically that, that works, right? Where the other types of cell, the sexome from other types of cells, other types of cells do the same, we actually haven't started. So logically, uh, we don't have a reason to challenge that. If we can use mesochemal stem cells, why don't we use a fibroblast and other types of cells? Yeah, so, yeah. The, so what's the mechanism of the effect? Well, we, in the paper, we did a very brief mechanistic study. We think, at least, at least we found a linkage uh, uh, between uh, uh, regeneration and uh, inflammation. Inflammation. So exomes seem to reduce the infla uh, inflammatory factors and promote pro-inflammatory pro factors. So inflammatory inflammation is one possible reason for for uh, uh, for autism like disorder kind of a study okay yeah so i think that makes sense because msc they are known to be immunosuppressive yeah thank you yeah yeah thank you all right any other question hey chen san uh, uh John, this is a very interesting. I think this research really have a major impact and also more impact to come down the road. Uh, I just have one question on the, uh, the, the chemistry is exciting. Um, when you actually look into the cycle and how yeah. the molecule move around. Uh, uh, but when you were trying to capture the feature for the so-called autism mm -hmm. using the mouse, um, I think one factor I was actually very curious is how do you get the mouse with autism? How do you make a mouse with autism, right? Uh, here shows the mouse. This is a one autism mouse model. Yes. The mother mouse were received a chemical uh, injection 12.5 days before the mouse were born. Yeah. So when the mouse are born, because the mother the mouse received a, a, a chemical treatment, the mouse will have symptoms that resemble autism in human. So, so that, this is one model. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually uh, a both a clearly defined, but also put the limitation on that's this true. particular autism. Model, that's true. Right? That's true. Yeah, yes. Um, that are you planning to actually check into different type of autism? Because the, yes. the, the fact that they induce autism actually is not the yes. one type. This is right? one chemical, induce, chemical induction method. Uh -huh. There's also genetic induction method. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we yeah. need to verify it in other models as well. So yeah, I fully agree with you. Yeah, Only with yeah. you know, multiple verification, we can say for sure, uh -huh. exome will be useful. Okay. But logically, I think it is useful, right? Stem cells can do it. And then when we use exomes, exomes can do it. Uh, 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 okay. Oh, okay. Last question. Oh, yeah. All right, there's a question in the chat room. Can you read it out? Yes. I wonder what is the volume of exome for the intranasal administration? Would the exome go to the lungs? Any safety issue if applied to humans? 
I thank you, Jack, for for the wonderful question. I think uh, if I'm remembering it, remembering it right, I we use a hundred microliters of the exomes for the intranasal administration. Would the exomes go to the lungs? Uh, we can see uh, primarily, with, at least within the time window that we examined, actually uh, exom exomes mostly stay in the brain, as you can see here. Whether for the long-term tra tracking, whether they can go to the lungs, we're not 100% sure. We actually, so from the, uh, the image you can see here, most of the exomes stay in the brain. But exactly where in the brain, we are still working on that because the brain has many structures as well. So any safety issue if applied to humans, we are not fully aware of. Uh, so the field of exome uh, therapy is still developing. I guess it's, uh, you, uh, that's why we uh, try to start up a company and uh, systematically study it, uh, which is beyond the, the academic environment can support. That's what we believe. Right, just a note. Actually, Randy Sherman is also a member of the advisory board for one company in the New York. They're working on the exosome therapy, something like that. Yeah. All right, one last chance for questions. Any question from the audience here or the in the Zoom? If you're not, thank you again, Xia Jiang. So let's move on to the Last speaker, okay, for, 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 for the research topic is Professor Yiling from the Department of Physics. I just would like to mention that Yiling re received the Young Research Award from CHK three years ago. And also this year, he is, he is one of the uh, uh, awardee for the LGC Research Fellowship. Okay, so very prestigious award. Okay, so please welcome Professor Wu Yiling. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Jiang, for the introduction. Um, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank Science Faculty for giving me the opportunity to share our work. Um, so uh, uh, we have learned many fascinating stuff uh, from the previous talks about living things, life. Okay, and uh, I'm also going to talk about um, uh, living systems or living matter but from a slightly different perspective. Um, I, I'm a biophysicist and my lab studies the motion and self-organization of living matter. And um, uh, when I look at those creatures under the microscope, um, I um, always view them at a stage greater than the petri dish, a stage that are so vast that uh, that covers many um, magnitudes of space and time. That is the universe. Okay, so here is a brief time history of the universe, of the obs observable universe. About 4.6 billion years ago, the solar system, together with the Earth, planet Earth, formed around this point. And not long after, not not long after, life began on this planet. And for the rest of three billion years more or more, uh, living things has co-evolved with, with this planet and has transformed this planet in many profound ways. Okay. And I believe life, living things will continue to do so um, in the future. So when I look at the creatures under my microscope, I keep wondering how living things arise from non-living matter is there any, is, it, is, is life an inevitable outcome of physical chemical interactions under certain conditions? Can the emergence of life be predicted from thermodynamic laws? Okay. Um, I'm not alone in asking these questions. Over the past hundred years, many giants have pondered these questions. Here I just name a few um, listed in the in, in the order of time, okay. So in 1920s, Oparin um, proposed the idea of chemical evolution in the primordial soup, okay. And this idea stimulated the famous Mueller and Urey experiment in 1950s, uh, who demonstrated that complex molecules such as amino acids can 
form under conditions simulating the prebiotic earth. Later, uh, Michel elucidated the physical chemical mechanism for energy metabolism that are conserved in all living forms, okay, so-called uh, chemical osmosis for ATP syn synthesis. And um, at a similar time, um, Eigen proposed the evolution of coarse species uh, that is precursors of macromolecules such as RNA and DNA before um, the origin, origin of the true form of life. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, other people, so in addition to these quests of uh, chemical evolution of life, many other people took a different approach and many of them are physicists by training. For example, Ilya Prigozhin in 1950s suggests that um, self-organized structures can form due, is, is a conserved feature of uh, systems that dissipate free energy. And in 1990s, starting from 1990s, the working mechanisms of molecular machines that spread, in, spread everywhere in, in the cytoplasm of all cells have been largely elucidated um, as a form of Brownian motors. So Brownian, Brownian, motors is, uh, Brownian motor is a concept arising from um, Richard Feynman's Brownian ratchet, okay, but uh, with the uh, free energy input. And in more recent decades, um, the organization or order of living things has been studied in a broader context, in the context of so-called active matter. So active matter is uh, referring to systems consisting of units that can transform, that can turn local free energy input into mechanical work. Obviously, all living things belong to active matter. And indeed, order or self-organization is a hallmark of living systems. There are many examples and many of them are crucial to the functioning of living processes such as embryogenesis. As we are looking in the movie, it's the development of the embryo of zebrafish, okay? We can see the egg, the fertilized egg as a bag of living material. And this bag of living material can grow and divide and differentiate into different forms of cells and organize the, themselves in different locations. Here, we are going to see the development of um, somites, the periodic appear, appearing, appearance of somites throughout the body. And as time goes, we see the uh, collective beating of the heart cells, okay, synchronized by their electrochemical coupling. And at a later stage, the neurons in the brain started to synchronize their firing uh, of the voltage, of the transmembrane voltage. And then this, the organism started to move. Okay. In addition to Complex organisms like, like a zebra fish, simpler organisms such as bacteria or single celled organism like amoeba can display a stunning um, order or organization. A fruiting body formation of uh, the testilium is a uh, well known, is an, uh, well -known example. And in my lab, um, we focus on, uh, our focus is to understand the motion and self-organization um, in living systems or living matter derived from bacteria. Why bacteria? As I mentioned earlier, life forms began 3.6 billion years ago. And the last common ancestor of all living beings or the uh, subsequent earliest forms of life must be very close to bacteria that we see today. And bacteria are simple to manipulate. They are ancient, they are simple. So for these reasons, I believe bacteria may hold the answers to many fundamental questions um, on the physics of living matter. And in the following, I would like to uh, showcase our recent efforts in trying to understand the order in uh, living matter. Um, in the first example, um, I'm going to talk about how simple 
physical interactions can give rise to spatial order. And this work was done by my uh, previous student, Shi Hao Ran. And, this is, and the experiment was done in this way. We collect a bunch of uh, a large population of motile cells and put them on the surface. And interestingly, these cells originally moving in a disorganized manner, they spontaneously self-segregate into three parts. At the outer rim, those cells display very high nematic order. Okay. And slightly inwards, the cells display a high degree of nematic order. And further inside, we see a, a dilute phase with um, random movement of cells. So this spontaneous ordering is Due to, is due to pure physical interaction between cells. Uh, that includes the steric hindrance and hydrodynamic um, interaction between the swimmers. And this self-organization bears important significance for, the, for a bacterial colony. As we see in this movie, materials can transport along the route established by this organized structure at a very efficient manner. Okay. And this provides a uh, bacterial colony with an expedited pathway to transport materials. Consider a bacterial colony that's one, mic one centimeter in diameter. If um, at, once, at one point of, of the colony produces some chemicals, comes some signals, these chemicals or signals would take 28 hours to go to travel across to the other side. But with this um, um, highway of material transport uh, made possible by the self organization of swimmers, this process can be done within several minutes. Okay, this is, and in another work, we um, discover a novel uh, mechanism for temporal order in. Uh, a dense collection of bacterial active fluids. And this work was done by previous student Chen Chong and Liu Song. Um, the idea is like this. If we, if we look at a dense collection of cells, their movement would appear quite random. Okay? This is typically known as bacterial turbulence. But if you look at them at a larger length scale, okay, you will see some hidden order emerging. And this hidden order would be best visualized by putting some passive traces in the system. So here we see the movement of two trace traces that undergo very regular periodic oscillatory movement, suggesting that the cells underneath are undergoing some form of very weakly synchronized collective oscillatory motion. And the mechanism behind this is that the cells somehow, the, the, the trajectories of these random trajectories are synchron uh, weakly coupled okay, um, in the way of uh, angular velocity coupling. Okay. So their angular veloc velocities are weakly coupled. So this is so-called weak synchronization. And um, previous example, all known examples in uh, multicellular systems uh, of collective oscillation involve inherent oscillators at the individual level. For example, individual cells would experience a uh, cyclic expression of genes, okay, or on and off of growth activities, or the firing or silencing of uh, membrane voltages. And these uh, local oscillators are coupled uh, via either long range or short range uh, mechanisms. And these coupling can often be well described by models uh, of coupled oscillators. For example, this promoter model. And in our case, we found the first instance of biological collective oscillation that does not involve explicit individual oscillators. Okay. And in, in the third example, we found a novel principle to design uh, spatial and temporal order simultaneously. And this was done by my uh, student Liu Song. Um, so in the previous two examples, we introduced the control of spatial and temporal order uh, via physical mechanisms. But the simultaneous control of both spatial and temporal order is more challenging. It usually involves very complicated uh, reaction diffusion 
hierarchies um, involving uh, some molecules called morphogen, okay? It's known as Turing mechanism. Or it involves the synchronization of individual oscillatory uh, uh, units, uh, such as the ones I uh, mentioned, the couple of oscillators. Or it has to uh, utilize uh, carefully designed genetic or protein regulatory pathways coupled to some kind, kind of diffusive signals. Okay. We wonder whether there are some simpler means to achieve this. And we found clue in the material property called visco elasticity. Okay. Visco elasticity is a property of fluids displaying both short term solid light behavior and the long term fluid light behavior. It's a um, um, common property shared by many polymeric fluids. Okay. And um, it is known that viscoelastic polymers can suppress turbulence. Okay. That um, could provide a means to yield spatial order. On the other hand, the elastic relaxation of these polymers can provide a mechanism of mechanical memory or feedback. And this can bring in temporal order. Okay. So indeed, uh, other theoretical studies have demonstrated that um, or suggested that the viscoelastic uh, environment can enhance the attraction or orientational ordering of micro swimmers. So we set out our experiment. We extracted DNA, which is a micro -mo molecule displaying viscoelastic behavior uh, from E. coli. And we supply these DNA polymers into bacterial active fluids. So above certain concentration threshold, they, a drop of bacterial active fluids of a size about a millimeter develops into a very organized um, giant vortex, okay. as shown in this video. So illustri as illustrated by the uh, uniform and temporally stable velocity uh, fields. So it's a giant vortex. It's a millisca millimeter scale vortex. And when we further increase the DNA concentration, this giant vortex started to switch its priority periodically as shown in the uh, velocity orientation field in the movie. And this looks like a torsional pendulum, but it's a self-driven one. And this oscillation is clearly um, seen in the uh, temporal trace of the um, vertical order. And the period or the frequency of this oscillation can be tuned by uh, changing the viscoelastic elastic properties of the material. Um, the mechanism is rather simple. Okay, so the bacterial, active, bacterial swimmers can exert active forces to deform the surrounding polymer matrix. And at the time scale of so-called active forcing time, tau, tau A here, and the polymer matrix, the deformed polymer matrix will relax mechanically at the time scale of tau P. So this polymer relaxation can change the movement of the bacterial swimmers. Okay, this is a feedback loop. When both time scales are comparable, the active stresses are accommodated by polymer deformation resulting in steady flow, okay, spatial order. And when the polymer relaxation time far exceeds the active forcing time, the polymer relaxation lags behind. Okay, and this triggers the flow instability giving rise to the os oscillatory behavior. And this idea was verified by a model, a active viscoelastic fluid model um, developed by our collaborators, Christina Maschetti at UCSB and her former student, uh, Shura Shankar, now a, now a Harvard fellow. Okay. So here they model bacterial uh, polarization um, and the collective flow and uh, the polymeric stress of the surrounding polymer environment together. And both analysis and numerical simulations of the model reproduce our experimental observations very nicely. For example, here the face map from experiment and from the linear stability analysis of the model matches very well. All right, to summarize, here we have um, 
highlight three remarkable forms of self-formalization in bacterial active fluids mediated by purely physical forces. We hope uh, this knowledge can uh, help us understand the order and self-formalization of general living matter systems. And we hope this uh, can fuel the development of non-equilibrium physics as well as uh, active matter engineering. And finally, I would like to thank my students who are involved in this work. Uh, Chen Chong, uh, he graduated several years ago and now in the machine learning industry. And Liu Song, now a postdoc in uh, IBS at Korea. And Shi Hao Ran, uh, uh, he's, he graduated last year and still trapped in my lab uh, to continue his discoveries. And also I would like to thank my collaborators, Eric Lauga and his student at Cambridge, um, Christina Mashoti at UCSB, as, as I mentioned, and his student, Shirat Shankar, and uh, Yuk Shoti at uh, CA Sakte France, as well as his assistant, Su Xiaqing at Suzhou University. And um, our fundings are from these agencies, CHK, uh, UGC, and, and SFC. Okay, with that, I would like to thank uh, your attention. Thank you again, Yili, for a very nice talk. Now, any question? All right, Chen San. Thank you. This is a very, very interesting and also quite an eye-opening experience for me. Uh, looking at the biological system under microscope. Um, never thought that they would actually move in such a dynamic, yet there is a special order. Um, I wonder for the oscillation and also for the vortex. Uh, I'm a chemist and, and I work on catalysts. I, I, I tend to think there's a something that actually at the molecular level that actually is responsible for such type of movement. Um, it, it, it's possible to actually speculate what could cause such a vortex type of movement that almost like a magnetic force behind it mm -hmm. or a, some type of field of force behind it. Yet, I don't know what it is, but um, also in the earlier when you, you showed the uh, uh, electron microscope dynamic spectra of the oscillation. If there is a something, a molecule with a metal center that actually could move around in the biomagnetic field. Uh, again, that I'm thinking out aloud uh, uh, without really knowing anything uh, on, on the scientific research side. Just look at the picture and my mind actually begins to hypothesize what could this be and what it might be. So lot of question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for your uh, comments. Um, yeah, yeah, indeed, these uh, self-organized structures are amazing. And um, um, at the molecular level, we believe it's uh, it's indeed self-organized. It's due to local energy input. So uh, the the individual units consume free energy from the chemicals, the chemical environment, and they turn this free energy input into movement. So they are individual swimmers. It can be regarded as active colloids, individual colloids. So, um, um, so all things occur at the level of micron scale, uh, not uh, at the nanometer scale. Um, but in the, in the living cells, if if you uh, look, uh, if you zoom in, uh, you will see many molecular motors, and these molecular machines are also free energy transducers, and they can also uh, generate uh, use free energy to in, in to, 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 to produce mechanical work or directed movement. And many of the phenomena we describe here can also be replicated in much smaller systems involving individual uh, molecular machines. Um, our, our systems are, can be regarded as um, a scaled up uh, mimic of the uh, uh, living, uh, the world of the living matter inside the, the cytoplasma. So it, for, for, for those uh, smaller scale systems, indeed the molecular uh, level uh, interactions and catalytic activities play very important roles in their um, uh, ordering. Right, there are two questions on the, on the chat box. Yes, the first question from uh, Min Zhong, uh, the, uh, what determines the time scale of the collective motion of um, bacteria? Okay, um, so the time scale um, 
here is uh, uh, I, I suppose you are referring to the to the last uh, example, um, the uh, drying vortices, right? Uh, so in that example, the uh, the period is determined by the viscous elastic relaxation time. Okay, and this relaxation time is um, <clears throat> is the rough time scale between uh, for the transition of uh, elastic behavior and fluid behavior for the uh, for the parametric fluid. So uh, normally this can be uh, from several seconds to tens of seconds. I'm not sure if this uh, answers your question. Okay, uh, so there's an, another question. Um, the there's another one, right? Uh, how the organization contributes to the bacterial functions. Yeah, so um, uh, we have a clear idea how uh, the first example, the spatial ordering, um, how, how it can contribute to the uh, bacterial functions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this organized uh, structures can provide an high speed avenue for material transport um, in bacterial colonies. Uh, whereas for the other types of, uh, for the other two examples, the temporal ordering and both spatial and temporal ordering, we have only some speculations. We haven't uh, done any uh, experiments to, um, to verify that these uh, phenomena um, have uh, real functions in 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 the in uh, real ph physiological functions. I would say so. And All right. Is there any question from the chat box? One more. One more. Okay. This one. So I wonder whether these motions are the same among all the bacteria that you tracked. Are there any exceptions that you may expect? Um, yeah, so he, here the, uh, the, the cells we, we are using are very generic uh, E. coli. It's a model organ organism for studying uh, bacterial active fluids. We uh, have tracked several other species similar to E. coli in terms of their uh, multi-organism. So uh, I, I would say that for bacterial species having sharing similar multi-organism, okay, uh, these phenomena can, can be reproduced. And we, we did uh, reproduce uh, some of the phenomena in, in uh, several other species, uh, not E. coli. And uh, are there any exceptions? Okay, yeah, I have answered this. If so, what may be the reasons? Can you name a few potential applications for your discoveries? Yeah, so uh, here um, uh, about the applications of, of our discoveries, um, I, I cannot name any any uh, at the at the point. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's embarrassing when uh, when people ask me these questions. So I would only say that uh, I, I hope this knowledge can advance our understanding of the organization of living matter, and hopefully uh, someone, ourselves or maybe other other people can can turn this knowledge uh, in active matter engineering. Okay. To, that, uh, that is to engineer novel materials that can self-assemble, self-renew. Um, okay, this sounds fascinating, but not within close reach of our hands. <laughs> All right, one last question from here, the audience here. Uh, hey, Yiling, I would like to ask uh, the first question, whether the are cell dividing in the process? Second question, where does uh, the behavior you, do you predict uh, you can find them in mammalian cells? Oh, okay, so uh, for the first question, uh, whether uh, cell division uh, is important here. So in in all our exam in all our uh, examples shown here, the cells are taken from um, stationary phase and put into fresh medium. So they will experience a two and two hour lag. Okay, so for two hours we are safe. Uh, they do not grow or divide. Uh, they just try to adapt to the new environment. Okay. Uh, for the second question, whether we can uh, observe similar things in mammalian systems. Um, um, yes, yes or no, uh, I believe yes. In, it, it, especially for the first case, um, spatial, um, spa uh, spatial confinement has been shown to direct spatial ordering in mammalian systems. Uh, but for the uh, second two scenarios, the visco, um, the the temp the emergence of temporal order. Uh, I, I I do not have um, uh, much knowledge about this, but uh, people have been studying.
the effect of viscous elasticity on um, on the organization of mammalian systems like tissues. Um, although I haven't seen any reports of similar behavior, but under certain conditions, this could occur. I, I remember I've seen a case that uh, fibroblast cells mm -hmm. will be uniformly moved together, will be uniformly, uh, uniformly moving together yes. under certain circumstances, mm -hmm. because you know, they form a skin-like tissue. Yes, and, and that falls below uh, in the, uh, the first example. First the, example. The, yeah, the yes. spatial confinement and physical interaction can uh, guide the, the spatial ordering. It, yes. It's a typical case of order, this order transition for, for uh, self-propelled particle systems in, the, in more general terms. Thank you. All right, thank you again, Yilin, for a really nice talk. Okay. Because we are running high, uh, running behind the schedule, so we have decided to just move on to the next section, okay, without any break. So why I'm now would like to ask uh, Itao to, to take over for, for the next section, okay?